Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> my professor is so boring. <laughs> He'll get his when I kill him. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other students didn't learn anything in that active shooter drill. Okay, well, there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, I guess maybe three ways to do it. Um, so nine. Uh, we have this rectangle that's at a funny angle. Uh, the angle is 40 degrees oh, from vertical. So this angle is 40 degrees. Um, and the lengths that length is 2.1 meters. This length is 1.3. Um, and there's a force vector in this corner of negative 200, negative 150. and a force vector in this corner of negative 400, positive 300. The angular velocity is negative 6 radians per second. And the velocity of the center of mass is 5 negative three meters per second. And uh, we want to calculate, this is called B in the problem, and we want to calculate the acceleration vector of B. Um, Well, yeah, uh, actually, I don't think we need that. Um, so, oh, velocity vector at A, velocity vector at C. Okay, let's skip all that. That's all just, that's all just kinematics. Yeah. Okay, so now this is a rigid body problem. Uh, oh, and it must give a mass. It's de it gives a density. Um, so 2,500 kilograms per meters cubed. Oh, the thickness is 0.1. So you can calculate the mass is equal to the density times the volume. And uh, so that's 2,500 times 2.1 times 1.3 times 0.1. It's not 0.1. And what do you get for the mass? Six eighty-two point five kilograms. That's big. Okay. Uh, those forces are not going to have a very big effect on something that massive. Um, so now we're going to do the rigid body problem. Uh, this is already a free body diagram, so I'm not going to do that again, I don't think. Um, well, in these problems, uh, you know, origin doesn't come into it because the only vectors we care about are vectors from one point to another one. But in for calculating those row vectors, you can always think of that as putting your origin at your about point and then calculating the coordinates of the points. 
Okay, so let's go through the steps. Uh, the first step is, is there a fixed point? No. So the about point is the center of mass. Second is the moment of inertia. Um, so the moment of inertia about the center of mass is equal to 1 12th times the mass times the length squared plus the width squared. So 2.1 squared plus 3 squared. Can someone calculate that? Yeah, so 300 something. Okay. Kilogram meters squared. Three, the free body diagram. We'll just use the one above. Then four, um, row vector. Force vector moment. Yep. Uh, yeah, let's not rotate it. Um, I don't think it's not going to be so bad to deal with, is it? Is it? Maybe it is. Yeah, you can use rotation. I'll show you another way to do it that isn't too bad, another way to think about it. Um, so in this problem, I'm not going to do a rotation. I think in the one where you remove a circle from the rectangle, I think uh, rotating the coordinate system makes it a bit easier. Um, OK, so the forces. OK, yep, that's a good way to do it. Um, are we assuming there's weight? No, neglect gravity. I, I, yeah, um, well, we're doing this problem in a plane. And so uh, you could think of this as like from above. You're doing this calculation from above. And so the plane that we are doing these calculations in, or yeah, or in space, but the, the plane that we're doing these calculations in, uh, like the weight is going into the page or whatever, so it's just not coming up. Mm -hmm. No, harder to rotate. More resistance to rotation. Well, think of it as the moments causing the angular acceleration. So a fixed set moment. It's equal to I alpha. So if I is bigger, alpha is smaller. If I is smaller, alpha is bigger. OK, so uh, the row vector for this negative 200, negative 150 force. So our row vector that we want is this. Right? So let's think of it as uh, that vector plus that vector. Um, So what are the directions of these two components? Uh, so if this is the coordinate system, one of those vectors is this direction, where this angle is 40 degrees. Yeah, we're given that it's 40 degrees from the vertical. So these two lines are 40 degrees from the vertical. And then this vector is perpendicular to it. So this is a right angle. And that means that 
to get from the positive x-axis to this is 130 degrees. And then to get from the positive x-axis to this is 130 plus 90, so 220 degrees. Okay. And so unit vectors in those directions are cosine and sine of either 130 or 220. And so now what I'm going to do to represent this vector is I'm going to go, since this whole side length is 1.3, the length of this vector is I'm going to go 0.65 times cosine of sine of 220. And then I'm going to go half of this, 1.05 times cosine and sine of whatever I said the other one was, 130. Um, so that row vector I drew is. Zero. 0.65 times cosine and sine. Thanks. I thought that was going to be a late slip. Uh, cosine and sine of 130 plus 1.05 times cosine and sine of 220. 2.1. Can uh, are we going to calculate that? Yeah, can someone calculate that? <laughs> what is it? Okay. Zero point three eight seven. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's in the uh, that's the row vector for that first force, negative one point one seven, zero point three eight seven. That force vector is negative two hundred, negative one fifty. And I also can't do that cross product in my head. Uh, Negative 1.17 times negative 150. I'm going to start dotting these at this point. 0.65, yes. Anybody have any questions about the reasoning of how I got that row vector? You know, you can always break up those vectors into any components you want. They don't have to be. They don't just have to be in x and y directions. You can break them up into any pair of perpendicular axes, you know. And they don't even have to be perpendicular. Actually, we're just adding vectors to get the total vector. Okay. Two fifty even. Positive. Okay. And then the row vector for the second one. Now we're going to this point in the. Uh, the right top corner. Yes, very good. So 1.17, negative 0.387. The force vector is negative 400, positive 300. Can someone calculate that cross product? 196.2. Okay. And now we can go to Newton's laws. Uh, do we have to use Newton's second law? Uh, you have to because there's no fixed point. That's well, it's coming from these force vectors. So Newton's second law says the force vector negative 200, negative 150. Well, they could have the center of mass could not be accelerating, and the and the points would still be accelerating. Um, 
That's right. Right. Or if the um, if the force is added up to zero. <laughs> Uh, that's right. If there was gravity, that would be the force, but right. So 680, what, what was that? 682.5. So is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. And then equation six is the rotational equation. And that says. 252.9 plus 196.2 is equal to 346.9 times alpha. That's three equations for three unknowns, three variables. And so you can solve for the acceleration of the center of mass and alpha. Yeah, can, so what do you get for alpha? 1.29 radians per second squared. And then what do you get for the acceleration of the center of mass? Zero point two two zero. Those accelerations are small because uh, those forces are pretty small compared to that gigantic thing. Um, it's over half a ton, and we're applying forces of like 100 pounds to it. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm just pulling numbers out of a hat. Not, a, not an actual hat. Figuratively. <laughs> yeah. Yes, always. Yeah. That's right. That's right. The angular acceleration represents the whole body. Trans that's true of all rotational quantities. Angular velocity, angular acceleration, that represents a whole rigid body. Translational velocity and translational acceleration just represent a point on the body. At a single instant, those accelerations Every kind of acceleration just represents a single instant. That's right, because that's because you use Newton's laws to calculate accelerations and angular accelerations. So that's you need to be given the velocities, but the loads determine the accelerations. Yeah, and then it would just be a, a um, kinematic problem, not a kinetic problem. Okay, so now finally we're to figuring out the acceleration of B. And we're going to do this as the acceleration of B relative to the ground is equal to the acceleration of B relative to the center of mass plus the acceleration of the center of mass relative to the ground. Um, this is this one. That's what we just solved. And this is circular motion. So the acceleration of B relative to the center of mass is equal to alpha cross R plus uh, omega cross omega cross R. And then add on the center of mass. And I guess you could write this all out as the acceleration of B relative to the ground is equal to 
alpha cross r plus omega cross omega cross r plus a c o m and the r in that is this Can you go over why in this problem you didn't locate it and maybe the best problem we had that circle is attacking the grid? Yeah, this one, we just, it was just because this one, we needed to come up with so few vectors to locations that it just didn't seem worth it. With the other one, we had to keep doing it because we had to figure out moments of inertia of the rectangle about its center and then the moment of inertia about the center of mass of the whole thing and then or I don't remember if there was a fixed point or whatever but there were there were like five or more times that we had to calculate vectors from one point to another one and it just I think it it was enough calculations that it probably saved some time but of course you could do you could use a rotated coordinate system for this and you could not use a coordinate system for the other one it's just a matter of what's going to take more or less time Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I don't think it would be like unreasonable to do a rotated coordinate system for this one or to not do it for the other one. But that's just how I chose to do them. Right. Yep. Do them both, and then make sure you get the same thing. <laughs> No, probably that's not going to work. That would be difficult, especially for you. <laughs> not because she's dumb, because she broke her wrist, just so everybody's on it. I just want to be clear. <laughs> There's two ways you could do it. Um, one is you could calculate all the, the location vectors, the row vectors and R vectors and stuff in a rotated coordinate system, and then apply the rotation matrix to get that in this given coordinate system. Or you could do a rotation matrix that goes from this, uh, this coordinate system to this one, and then multiply it times the force vectors. Your answers would be valid in either case, but they wouldn't match because they're, your final answers are in different coordinate systems. Any other questions about this one? Any other homework questions you'd like to see? Mm -hmm. Did you get it to cancel out and you just yeah. didn't see where? Why? You want to do 13? Okay. Well, there, there is a short answer for why it cancels out, and that is that. Um, the only forces acting are both proportional to the mass. And um, there is gravity, but so there are two forces. Uh, let me draw the problem. So you have this like meat cleaver shape. Don't get any ideas, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird but strangely enticing idea. <laughs> uh, 
I just that's funny. I just watched an episode of The Sopranos where they did that. <laughs> no, well, experimental. They uh, they took a meat cleaver to someone's arm. He was dead though. That's the good news. Yeah. Okay, so this down here is a pin. And um, at the instant shown, it has no angular velocity. And we're just trying to figure out what's the acceleration of the point A. Okay, so uh, why does it not depend on the mass of this thing? Because if you think of the two sides of Newton's laws, um, think of Newton's second law first. On the left side are all the forces, and in this case, all the forces are proportional to the mass. And on the right side is MA. Obviously, that's proportional to the mass, and so the M's cancel out. And then... Uh, think of rotational Newton's second law. On the left side are the moments. Well, the moments are all provided by these forces, so those are all proportional to m. And on the right side is I alpha. I is proportional to m. And so all the m's cancel out. And what that says is, um, as long as there was no friction in either case, lengths were all the same. If this weighed 50 tons, that acceleration would be the same as if it weighed two ounces. Just the same as, you know, there are a lot of problems like that. Like a, when we talked about things rolling down a ramp, the mass canceled out. Um, when you think of things sliding down an incline, the mass cancels out. Yeah, it cancels out of those. So what we saw was that, remember I told you, you should try to find some sucker to make all these bets with, where like, what's gonna roll faster, like a quarter or a disc this big? And the answer is it'll be the same. Okay, uh, so it's a rigid body problem. Let's just go through the steps. Um, so step one, does it have a fixed point? Yes, uh, it's fixed at that pin. So the about point is the pin. And then the second one is a, uh, this is a sort of a long calculation, but we need the, moment of inertia of this thing about the pin. And that is the moment of inertia about the pin for, uh, let me break it up into like rectangle one and rectangle two. Rectangle one has its center of mass at the center of that rectangle, and two has it at the center of that rectangle. So the moment, total moment of inertia about the pin is equal to the moment of inertia about the pin of rectangle one, plus the moment of inertia about the pin of rectangle two, and the moment of inertia about the pin of rectangle one is equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass of rectangle one plus the mass of the first one times the distance from the center of mass uh, to the pin squared. Mm -hmm.
the centroid. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I bet it does. Because, uh, yes, I'll bet it does. But I don't know that for sure. I'd have to think about that. I bet it lies along the line between those, and it's closer to the centroid of the more mass between along that line. Uh, M2. <laughs> All right, so this is what we have in front of us. We have to figure out moments of inertia of these pieces about their centers of mass, and then we have to figure out, well, uh, we have to figure out the relative masses of these things expressed in terms of this unknown mass M. Let me write that up here. Um, so this thing has a total mass M. And that's what's going to cancel out of the problem. OK, so how are we going to get these masses? Let's do that first. Um, well, we know that the ratio of the mass of 1 to the total mass is equal to the area of piece 1 over the total area. Area of piece 1 is 0.6 times 0.5. Um, so three. The total area is point three plus point one two is the area of the little one. Area of the little one is point one two. The total mass is the sum of those two, so 0 0.42. That's just areas. But yes, uh, but now we'll go M1 is equal to um, 0.3 over 0 0.42 times M, which is uh, 5 sevenths, 5m over 7. Well, there's only two pieces, so we know m2 has to be 2m over 7. And so now the moment of inertia of um, piece 1 about its center of mass is this is a rectangle, so we have 1 12th times the mass of piece 1 times uh, they have to add up to 7m over 7, so it's just the leftover, but you could also do it using this approach. Um, so we have 0. 0.6 squared. <clears throat> Plus 0.5 squared. So, uh, can someone calculate that? Zero point zero three six kilogram meters squared. Be careful with significant figures too. Like we've just thrown away um, a lot of precision here uh, because I have this written out with only two significant figures. You know, I don't really care how many you use. I usually just try to keep about as many as I'm patient enough to keep. You know what I mean? Um, but right now. All of this stuff we've done has a precision of only two significant figures. I don't know. Maybe that's an exact answer, but if if the answer is 0.03616124, then we've given up a lot of the precision we had. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Who was I? I would, I'm going to do it the same way we talked about it yesterday. So let's say that this length is A, this is B, this is C. Okay. Um, there are three coordinate axes that this can rotate around. One is this, one is this, and one is this, right? And you can think of those as actually being physical pins that this, so if we're rotating about this one, you can spin it around that pin, right? If we're rotating around this one, we can spin it like a rotisserie. And, uh, if it's this one, we can spin it this way, okay? So now to figure out which dimensions you need to use, once you've figured out what axis of rotation you're talking about, think of, think of looking at the thing um, along that axis of rotation. That's what you're viewing it, okay? That's how you're viewing it. Think of sticking yourself in the eye with that axis, okay? That's how you're looking at it. Okay, and um, then from that viewpoint, you use the dimensions that you see in that plane, you know? So if we're talking about a rotation about this axis, imagine looking at it along that axis, then the plane we see only has the dimensions A and C. The thickness B, yeah. It doesn't. We don't have to assume that it's thin. Um, that thickness just doesn't come into the problem. That could be a mile wide, and the moment of inertia is the same. B could be a mile. You know, it doesn't matter. What if you're looking at it? So if you're looking now, if you're thinking of it rotating like this, about this axis, okay? Then imagine looking straight down that axis. What are the dimensions you see in that plane now? A and B. And so for your moment of inertia, you're going to use A and B. Um, and then the last one is the rotisserie one. Um, it makes my mouth water imagining that delicious rectangular solid. <laughs> um, so if it's spinning that way, you're looking down that axis. What are the dimensions you see? B and C. So that would be one twelfth mass times quantity b squared plus c squared. For a non-thin, did I? Does it say thin plate in the? The so if it's rotating about any of these axes. The dimension along that axis doesn't affect the problem at all. Whether it's thin or thick, it doesn't affect it. So if you're if you're rotating about this axis, B doesn't affect anything. So okay, so the thin thing. So let's think about. Mm -hmm. So let's think about a new solid that's like this. And now this dimension is small enough that we're going to ignore it. Now you can think about it the same way that we just thought about this other one. So we'll think of a rotation about that axis, that axis and that axis. And I'll say this is A and this is B. And that thickness is negligible. So if it's rotating about this axis, imagine 
poking yourself in the eye with the axis. What are the um, what are the dimensions that you see? A and B. So that's one twelfth times mass times a squared plus b squared. Now let's think about this horizontal axis. Poke yourself in the eye with that axis. What are the dimensions you see? B. Only b. It's negligible in the other in the other along the other axis. And so this is uh, one twelfth times mass times b squared. You make the thin rod approximation in that case. Okay. And now this one, same idea. Poke yourself in the eye with that. What's the, the shape you see is this long, thin uh, rod with a length of A and no thickness. So again, you only use one. So if the thickness wasn't negligible, you'd just do it the same way as the A and B side? Yes. Okay. That's right. And the reason that the, the rectangular solid thing reduces to the slender rod thing is that if they're, if one of these sides is way longer than the other one, in the formula, you're squaring those lengths. So say this length is one and this thickness is 0.01. So what happens to those right relative sizes when you square them? The one you square, you get one. The 0.01 you square and you get one times 10 to the minus four. And so that, that squaring it really accentuates the differences between long stuff and short stuff. And so, and so, yeah, that thickness is, say this is a meter and this is a centimeter. Well, it turns out that centimeter has a very unimportant effect on the rotational properties. Um. Where are we? Uh, okay, so we got this. Um, the hardest part of this problem, yes. Oh, yes, thank you. You're right. That's important. That's right. And so, um, so now you have this. Now you can figure out the distance from the center of mass of one to the pin, use the parallel axis theorem, do the same thing for the other one, and then add those together. And finally, you're done with calculating the moment of inertia for this whole thing, which is the longest part of this problem. The rest is, is pretty much like the other problems. From the center of one to what's going to be our about point. How do you figure it out? Uh, you could go. Um, this whole thing is point 0.5. So you could think like um, <coughs> from here to here, it's point 0.25, right? So that means it's another point 0.05 to get to this edge. And then it's another and then it's another point one to get to the center. So horizontally it's point one five to get from here to there. Vertically it's point three uh, plus point six. So horizontally is point one five. Vertically it's point nine. And then just use the Pythagorean theorem. Since we're squaring that distance anyways, it's just going to be point one five squared. So distance squared is going to be 0.15 squared plus 0.9 squared. But it's trigonometry. Just um, You're trying to figure out that hypotenuse. Make a little right triangle there and figure it out. OK, that's all. Sounded sarcastic. <laughs> Well, yeah, then that's all statics. So um, think more of like MMA throws and punches. And then, okay, yeah. Yes, that kind of stuff you can do. Thank you. Because in stuff like that, you're taking advantage of the inertia 
of the body, you know? A significant part of the forces come from the fact that it's moving. Yeah, sure. Hi. Ooh, thanks. Okay. Oh, I better write one. Yes. Friday would be fine too. Okay. Well, first, there, there's no late stuff. Um, why don't you just leave it like that? So you're going to do that problem. You'll have that problem assigned again. Make a mental note and do it the right way next time. Yeah. Okay. Yes, at 10 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock right now at, um, you know where the tutoring center is? It's on the second floor, like right in the middle. It's the built, it's the room that you're facing right when you come up the main stairs. Yeah. Okay, yep, bye.